in the document, they say we're lacking personnel with the foreign language skills. We can't counter all this Chinese craziness because we don't barely have anybody who speaks Chinese. And so, um, yeah, that's one thing. You, they talk about um, they talk about this. They say the director of the CIA should refocus the CIA to an OSS-like culture and mandate that all CIA employees acquire as a condition of securing senior rank, additional or enhanced language skills, technical or cyber expertise, or field training or serve in overseas assignments. It's very important because um, over decades, the CIA has been uh, turned into a shell of its former self because they would hire people that are young um, people who have an uh, a 120 IQ, they have some sort of a university degree, they m speak one foreign language, um, and they look like a foreigner maybe, so they could pass off as as somebody from another country. Um, but but you know, then you send these people abroad, and they don't want to take any risks. They they don't have this OSS type culture, getting their hands dirty. They just want to be stationed in a more or less safe country or they want diplomatic uh, protection or they want to be stationed in a neutral country so they can set up safe meetings with potential sources. And that's a, of course, that's, that's a way to do it, but it's not the only way to do it. I think that um, during the, the Bush years, um, there were hardly any foreign assets left who uh, were, were willing to take on a significant risk. So this, of course, made the United States blind. This is, of course, also before 9-11 happened. The intelligence community was gutted because of the molds and they didn't have the proper personnel. So they talk about the personnel and when they mention the, the OSS-like culture, now the OSS was more focused on direct action it was kind of like a ripoff of the British SOE, the Special Operations Executive. So there wasn't even much real espionage going on with the OSS. It was like commando troops uh, doing things. So I think what they mean by that is a broader uh, approach going back to the roots of intelligence. But uh, you can make a lot of mistakes uh, while doing that. So if you just hire young people, um, who look a certain way and they talk about the stupid diversity in the intelligence community. Of course, that's it's a huge problem and you get infiltrated by, you know, uh, communists and everything. But if you do it the other way, if you just do it the old school way, uh, you can make big mistakes too. And we saw that with the OSS and we saw that with the CIA. They had their own performance assessments of themselves and these assessments, they were just they were classified for a long time and when we finally got to read it, their own assessment about themselves was terrible. They said, our intelligence is bad, the communists are feeding us garbage and we just write up that garbage. Many problems, even though the, the OSS and then the early CIA, they, uh, they had recruited people from the higher classes in society. They went to Yale. They got people from Yale, they got people from Wall Street, some adventurists who had experience in foreign countries, you know, with certain corporations. They tried to uh, get to that pool of people from the privileged class because they thought that's the way to do it. It's how the British did it, because the British, the most important British families, they go back a thousand years. I'm not kidding. They go back a thousand years and more. So they have this multi-generational vetting process nailed, so they thought. But um, when you try to copy that stuff nowadays, especially in America, you, you just take people from the privileged class and you give them the senior positions in the CIA. If you have a breach in that privileged class, uh, you're screwed because people don't want to go after uh, their own cousins or somebody from their own family. You know, if somebody becomes suspicious or somebody acts in a certain way, um, it's hard for you to go after that person because now it's the reputation of him, it's the reputation of the family, maybe your own reputation on the line, and you don't want harm to come to these people. And this is, I think, what ultimately screwed uh, the British because they thought they had it all figured out. They had thousand year, a thousand year history, they had their own circle, their own family intelligence service. 
But then they got sort of infiltrated by the communists. And once the communists have somebody or, or compromise somebody like uh, Lord Louis Mountbatten, it's it's a it's it's a crazy crazy situation because then this aristocrat mole or asset can protect other moles, and so if a, if the breach is on the British side or in in a liaison liaison group between America and Britain, how do you get to that mole? How do you find that breach when that breach is not even happening on American soil? So if you do it that the 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 modern way, the left wing way, nothing but problems. But if you also if you also you do it this old school way, recruit people from the privileged classes, that can backfire too. Sure, it all depends. You know, class. You know, and there are some people that have complained on my Twitter and elsewhere that oh, Nevin, why do you look at everything through class? You know a class basis and look i mean yes class is very important and class divisions are very rife in the united states but look there are going to be good and bad elements in every social class number one number two and that's how i kind of look at everything in general uh there's always exceptions to the rule everything is always more complicated than that and i think you gave a great historical view i think your work on lord Louis montbatten really gave me pause. I was like, huh, wow, yeah. uh, in your latest book that we talked about. But let's talk about the intelligence culture, because it's the Project 2025 really likes to be woke, 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 woke everywhere you go. Now, what is woke? And perhaps we can do a show on that. Um, but putting that aside, the intelligence failures and the challenges faced by the American intelligence community and the intelligence communities, in my opinion, of the free world have always been rife and problem before woke became a vocabulary word when woke basically means you woke up in the morning to get your coffee or tea and go to work. Um, and I want to read something. Um, it's in another newsletter article that's coming out called The History of Intelligence Failures and Defections Within the CIA. And this was when Ang James Angleton, when he was pushed out of the CIA's counterintelligence department, Raymond Rocca, who is Angleton's head of research of CIA counterintelligence, briefed the new incoming counterintelligence chief, George Kolaris, on Soviet intelligence practices and strategies. And I'm going to read this, and then we're going to have a good discussion on this. Rocca offered to brief Kolaris on the deception operations of the Lenin era. Kolaris ignorantly responded, but that all happened a half a century ago. Mm. I want to know what's happening now. <laughs> and of course I said, Kolaris could not comprehend that our adversaries would reuse old strategies to deceive and ultimately defeat the West through disinformation. If an intelligence strategy was successful in the past, why wouldn't Moscow or Beijing or wherever would try to use them again? Now, let me read what the North Vietnamese Prime Minister during the Vietnam War, I think in 1969 to 1970, Pham Van Dong stated to American anti-war leftist activists, many of whom, let's just lay it out on the table, are traitors to the United States. You visit North Vietnam, you make propaganda mm. and sabotage, you do worse things against America forces and allies as far as I'm concerned, you're a traitor. Sorry, it's just the way it is. Um, Fam, Prime Minister Pham uh, Van Dong of North Vietnam stated, you have to fight this war with intelligence, not with computers. The computers merely multiply man's stupidity thousands of times. And look, I despise communists, but I can't help but thinking, man, these people have the picture. And that's when you read statements like that, it's like, oh my God, they understand us better than we understand ourselves. And what, and I think you brought up a very good point, Alex. And when you mentioned the lack of discussion really about moles and super moles and things of that nature, the deeper uh, aspects of strategic deception, that's what reminded me. You reminded me of this piece that I was working on and the research that I'd done and found this a few years back, some of this information. And you're right. This notion of 
deep level strategic deception practice by even comparatively economically weak uh, countries that were adversaries of the United States needs to be made front and center. So the problem is not merely wokeism, if you want to call it that. The problem goes deeper before even wokeism was even a thing and created and entered uh, our political parlance, the political discourse. So what are your thoughts about what I've read to you, the exchange between Kolaris and Raqqa, as well as what the North, former North Vietnamese Prime Minister Pham Van Dong, who is a very, very well-known, well-established Vietnamese communist in Vietnam's Communist Party history. What do you think of that? What, exa what, what do you mean exactly? Um, what aspect are you referring to? The depth, I guess, what I'm saying, that the fact that really the intelligence failures are cultural in the CIA, that it oh, predated yeah. wokeism, it's a lack of understanding of strategic deception. It's the short-sightedness yeah, of Kolaris. What, what I it's like, would... oh, it does not happen yeah. now. It's it, yeah. everything that matters um, is now. We can't look at the past and assume that other countries yeah. are going to recycle mm. uh, strategies that, that worked for them in the past. I think a huge. I think the the issue here is this, um, in my opinion. So when when you recruit an average person, let's say average middle class want to call it that or maybe even lower middle class yeah person with good grades and speaks foreign languages and is willing to take risks you know everything you recruit a, a person from the peasant class um for intelligence that person has um a variety of experiences in his life uh you know is his his life so far right so um it's likely that this peasant class person um, has experience. It's likely that this person has experienced bullying. Um, it's likely that this person has attachment issues because, in the peasant class, it's it's become increasingly difficult to make true friends, um, to have a deep sense of loyalty towards other people from the peasant class. And I think that's way much of more of a problem in Germany than it's in in the United States. Um, because there's there's a huge difference between Americans and Germans, even though there's common roots. Oftentimes, um, I've I've uh, I, I've gotten to know uh, several Americans over my life. Um, personally, I also have you know relatives in America, and they're just different. So even when Americans complain about problems in society. Uh, you know, it's still there's still a lot more substance in America than you could find here. But still, this becomes a bigger issue in America. So, so the average person from the peasant class has attachment issues. They have issues and problems with authority because maybe the parents uh, were making serious mistakes. The teachers were not good. There were no real role models that they had access to. Uh, so the, the experience of a peasant class person is really, really problematic. So if you recruit a peasant into the CIA, for example, or the FBI, um, this person may not have that attachment to the system, to the authorities, to the people that come from a higher uh, uh, class in society. And I think this is where a lot of the problems have come from and also infiltration by by uh, serious communist networks. So, of course, Project 2025, they want to curb that. Um, and, and so they want to have a certain uh, mindset when it comes to intelligence. And they talk about leaks a lot. So they say that the president should immediately revoke the security clearances of any former directors, deputy directors, or other senior intelligence officials who discuss their work in the press or on social media without prior clearance from the current director. Um, I, intelligence community agencies, including the CIA, should minimize their public presence and vigorously investigate any and all leaks. Uh, so, yeah, um, you can. I think people can understand why leaks happened on a lower level or a mid-level because if you recruit people from the peasant class 
they may think that they don't have the option of addressing serious issues within the system because they think they get fired, they get their clearance revoked, they can never work in that field again, their life is ruined. So they may choose to leak stuff to the to the press and also some senior people, they may, uh, uh, you know, have some serious issues and think they can't solve these issues internally. So imagine if a, a person from a, from a privileged background in intelligence, if, if that privileged person is, is screwing up, he's become an alcoholic, he's making mistakes, he's not really uh, uh, performing the way you would expect him to perform that would justify his position, but you can't get around this guy. You can't really resolve this internally without risking your career. So this is kind of one big issue. Um, and also, um, when when you talk about these leakers, I mean, how can somebody like Alex Jones, uh, how can Alex Jones cheer on Project 2025, but also be a fan of WikiLeaks? Because WikiLeaks, they became famous for material supplied by a baseline soldier, uh, Bradley Manning at the time, and, and who then became Chelsea Manning. So he's like in the trans community. Um, but if we look into the background of, of Manning, we see a lot of bullying, we see problematic parents, all these peasant class issues. Um, and I think that's what ultimately uh, made him leak that stuff and think this is the way to serve America by divulging secret information. And this was, of course, uh, 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 a super uh, terrible choice from that soldier because he couldn't understand what problems he would cause by this. And so, um, yeah, I mean, of course you need to protect the secrets. This is very important. But if you go into the other extreme, like suggested through this 2025 document, if you make it old school, it almost sounds like the British Official Secrets Act. In Britain, if you leak anything, if you question anything, if you mess mess up with mess with the rules in any sort of way you are done and over you can get expensive lawyers it doesn't mean a thing the british can squash their own people if they misbehave in any way but what happens if you have a lord louis mountbatten what happens if you have other weird people that that uh, appear to be molds or or pave the way for other molds. How do you deal with this in the British system? And how do you deal with this craziness in the American system if if they go to the other extreme and say any leaking is illegal, you can't talk to the press, it's going to be so authoritarian. Uh, is, is the leadership good enough to justify, um, you know, this inquisitorial type system? Yeah, I mean, look, the intelligence war is a many-faceted issue, um, and there ultimately needs to be a balance, uh, you know, between preserving liberty, but and but also ensuring national security. And you know, look, sensitive information should not be leaked uh, to the public. I mean, there's been quite a, here in the United States has been quite a bit of damage regarding that. You have the case of Philip Agee. You had the case of Edward Snowden, who went to China, controlled Hong Kong, and then Russia, and provided, you know, all kind of manner of secret information. Where even one Chinese People's Liberation Army general said that Edward Snowden was more valuable than several army divisions. And I'm butchering the quote, but that's basically what he said. Um, so I do believe there needs to be some strong controls. Where I like you earlier in half an hour earlier mentioned there's really no preventions against super moles and the super mole problem has existed as you know as you've talked about in other programs uh in the british intelligence with mi5 and mi6 there's serious evidence which points to sir roger hollis uh formerly the head of the mi5 uh as being a possible soviet mole you look at uh, the uh, Cambridge University Soviet spy ring of the 1930s and 1940s, uh, you know, for example, uh, Harold Kim Philby. Uh, you know, you look at all these uh, situations here, and Philip Agee, by the way, you know, he was 
stayed resident in Britain after he left the CIA, and eventually he was expelled, as he rightfully should have been. Uh, but he was consorting with the um, yeah. with the Cuban DGI and everything in Britain and elsewhere. So yeah, I mean, you know, obviously there needs to be a balance. Uh, but when it comes to leaking secrets that compromises, let's say this is just my general position, the identities or the operations of intelligence operators uh, or intelligence uh, agents, yeah, you need to be punished for that. And there are there are media there are uh, media actors, actors in the media that are deeply problematic that in the name of a journalistic scoop, <clears throat> um uh are very problematic they cause a lot of damage to american national security and you know you can't you shouldn't have yes government overreach and no checks and balances on government intelligence operations but you know when you had the anti-intelligence crusaders in the house and the senate here in the united states like the church committee for example going after the cia and fbi I mean, sure, there are excesses and whatnot, but that also had the levy guidelines and other measures crippled our FBI and our CIA intelligence capabilities so so bad that by the 1980s, it was said that the Cubans and the other and the Eastern European services considered the American and domestic intelligence, quote, a joke, according to Robert Moss and Arnaud de Borchgrave uh, at the time. So, uh, yeah, I mean... Yeah, I, I, I think you bring up a, a valid point, but you know that's kind of my position I think on that, that the American, particular issue. 